Welcome to PL Priorities and Lifestyle with your host, Rob Schultz. Rob is the founder and president of Schultz Wealth. All opinions expressed by Rob and his guest are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Schultz Wealth. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for investment decisions. Please refer to our website for more information. Welcome everybody to PNL Priorities and Lifestyle. This is the podcast that I put on every other week and I have Chad Bruce. Chad is in the house. Woo! Well, welcome Chad. Thank you. Good to be on. Thank Good you so much, Rob. Good to have you. Man, we have talked about this stuff before and so I'm like super stoked about having you on because I've always thought you have a perspective that needs to be heard with regard to business transition because you are, you're a G2, you're a second generation guy. And a lot of times I think first generation we hear about all the time about trying to, you know, somebody who started the business and is moving it maybe to, maybe to a son or somebody else, whoever it may be, but we don't, we don't hear from you guys that much. Uh, nobody wants to talk to us. I want to talk to you. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, I, you know, I, there's a lot of things I have I, I feelings on this is that a lot of times financial advisors or CPAs or lawyers, uh, you know, when you're a senior generation business owner, you're the original, you're the founder, you've got experience and you've developed your own network of lawyers, CPAs, you know, advisors, vistage chairs, and you know, you're going to go to that person. Well, when you have a second generation that shows up, Sometimes they're talking to those same exact people, right? And they're having this conversation with yeah. that same person. Oh, yeah. And they're just kind of looking down at you, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay. And so I think it's a little bit of a forgotten thing, you know, because who's got the money at the table? Right. Dad, mom, aunt, uncle, yeah. they're the ones with the money. So the second generation kind of sits there at the kids' table waiting for their opportunity to speak up. And awesome, man. So I'm hoping maybe today we can convince some people out there to, you know, Come on, maybe look at those second generations as okay. an opportunity. I like it. I like it. Let's see if we can find that chip on your shoulder yeah. that you're really <laughs> yeah. talking. As well. All it's right, good. it's there. All right, let's go find it. Let me read a couple of things. I want to introduce you to kind of everybody. So Chad is, is a second generation business owner. He's president of Glue Down Incorporated. Really cool company. I'm going to want to talk about that a little bit too. Uh, and his, his mom and dad started it in 1981, okay? And then you purchased it in 2015. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. It's led a really cool overhaul of the company, uh, which again, I want to talk about. I think is very interesting how, how you've, you've really shifted the direction of the company. And uh, you, I guess going more to kind of these uh, creative and unique solutions in the construction industry is where you've had, we're headed where before it was more manufacturing, right? Yeah, okay. exactly. Um, so huge interest in family transition because, uh, like I said, we've we've talked about this stuff before and had a lot of a lot of discussions regarding it, and uh, also kind of had a group that you were working with, like a almost like a therapy group, right there for a while. I guess yeah, you could kind of think of yeah, it as a like therapy it. group. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know where where it was for me. A quick backstory on this is I got involved with my parents' business in 2003. I was living in Seattle. And a uh, family event, needed to come home, uh, help out with the family business. And, uh, you know, kind of said to my dad, well, hey, look, you know, I'm going to be here six months, a year, and then I'm going to move on. I'll do what I can to help you guys out. In 2003, I'm, I'll fix your website, you know, whatever, and you know, do some of the technology things that were definitely not on the horizon. And, you know, fast forward to, uh, well, 2015, I bought my dad out. So, yeah. so there was quite a bit of a journey and change as that, that went on. Uh, and so when I got to the other side and went through all the trials and tribulations of the transition, just sort of had a moment where I'm like, you know, man, it, that should have been a lot easier. Like, mm-hmm. I feel like there was a lot of issues we ran into. My dad on his side of the table, on my side of the table, that just shouldn't have been there. And when I started to look out into the ether, Google searching, whatever, looking for people who focused on the mechanics of a family business transition, I really felt like there was a gap that was there. And so I reached out and I tried to find people that were in my network that were going through that transition as a second generation. I said, well, would, wouldn't it be great if we got the senior generation and that next generation in a room together to talk about the challenges they're facing and to see if there's some collaborative work that we could do as a group 
to help move this on. And so we did that and, and uh, we worked together uh, at, for a couple of years. Unfortunately, when COVID happened, you know, we sort of things got busy oh, yeah. and we all got pulled yeah. in different directions. Uh, and it was totally voluntary. You know, there was no formality to it. But it, you know, it's one of those things I would love to get back and going again. Um, but I think we were also very helpful in getting some people through some transition and getting through some of those difficult conversations that happen. I mean, that's yeah. just a part of this. No, that's great. That, that's that's really good. Giving back. You know, just trying to trying to help people through things like that. Uh, tell us about glue down, you know, real quickly. Tell because I think what's happened, COVID happened, but then you got really busy. Your your business is just killing it right now. Yeah, we we are very very uh, fortunate that COVID actually ended up being a very uh, positive experience for us for the organization. Uh, to again going back to the introduction, parents start a company. We're focused on manufacturing. That meaning that we help people either make the widgets, uh, items that they that they were making. It could have been a bottle of beer with a label on it, yeah. uh, mattresses, robotic dinosaurs. We actually did clusters for fighter jets. Did all different types of things in manufacturing, but you know, no secret to the world is that industry is sort of you know it slowed down. You know, in the '90s, especially early 2000s, it sort of crested. And we were looking for new opportunities to grow into a totally different market. And that's when we got into construction. And what we do, uh, starting then and even now, what we focus on in construction is using adhesives to replace fasteners. And as a general person, you probably don't care very much whether or not they use a nut and bolt or they use glue. But the reality is there's a lot of industries that have made that transition successfully for a lot of benefits. So for example, signage that's on highways, they used to use rivets and nails and everything to put it in. We get rust spots, you get damage to the sign, but you can actually use adhesives to hold all those pieces oh, in I place. See. Sure. And what happens now, you have a sign that's gonna be more resilient, you can actually get more creative with the designs, and again, person driving down the highway doesn't think twice no. about the fact they're using adhesive. I just support. assumed that there was you know, a screw in there somewhere. Right? Yeah, okay. exactly. And so for us, and what glue down does today is we tend to look at applications where somebody is using a fastener and it is damaging the integrity of that building or structure. And so for our core product, which is in the tilt up space, which uh, a lot of people don't know what that is, but effectively you'll see it on the highway. You're going to see this blank piece of concrete that's got nothing on it. And about a month later, you're just going to see all these panels or the walls of the building lifted up with these uh, support beams going down. And what we do is we effectively design and mold the walls of the building horizontally on top of that concrete surface. Mm -hmm. And our adhesive holds all of that in place. And then once that panel now is cured and ready to be lifted, it lifts up and goes in place and our adhesive's job is done. Well, what happened with COVID is people started buying stuff online. They already were, but it went to a 10. And so for us, we do a lot of warehouse distribution. It could be, uh, oh, you know, it could sure. be uh, like Amazon. Amazon, right? yeah, Amazon's a big uh, customer. Uh, it could be a UPS, a you know, distribution center. Uh, but even things we don't think about. I mean, you could have a furniture warehouse that you're thinking about. Like, hey, it, it, we need to have goods closer to it. But what is really interesting, the industry, and this is happening a lot in El Paso, is they're building schools with this technology. Because what they have found is that that building method has very high insulation rates that you can create. So you can make a very efficient, low cost building, and that's perfect for schools. Okay, um, so tilt wall schools. Yep, wow. and then the other thing that is growing as well, it's up in Canada right now, is they're actually making uh, a, a multi-family structures, apartment complexes, also using okay. this construction method. Uh, and so it's a growing industry. I mean, it, it, they're, they're learning more and more things we can do with the method. And our adhesives are growing with that. We're coming out with new technologies because you can imagine if we're using an adhesive that's in Texas, the performance needs to be different than if it's in Canada. And so we're having to develop new technologies to do it. So it's great for glue down today as the company's gone its journey. Is we're able to take all of our experience my dad did, all the learning we did in manufacturing, to helping Coca-Cola do everything they've done through the years. We take all that and now we're applying it to construction and we're hoping to create a building, again, that is going to be uh, you know, less impact to the concrete structures or you know, metal joints or anything. And that you're just really going to get a better longer lasting building with our adhesives being utilized. Gotcha. And so my understanding is, is that traditionally, you know, they basically create a mold, right, for this, uh, for this wall on the, on the slab, and then they would nail 
that in. And then when they knock that, that mold off, it creates those pock marks that we've all seen in concrete, right? And then what you're able to do with the adhesive is, is just make it where as if that never happened. You still have the smooth surface, right? That is 100% correct. Okay. Yeah, okay, we, gotcha. we go for it in the industry, we say a no hole slab. Uh, yeah, if you're Amazon and you're building a million square foot building, <laughs> what you yeah. don't want is, is tens of thousands of holes in it. Uh, it creates a maintenance issue and everything. So, yeah, our adhesives help prevent that from ever occurring. Yeah, so that's, that is really cool. And, and this is a direction that you, as the second generation, took the business. Correct. I mean, this wasn't anything that was happening until until after 2015. Is that correct? Um, no, actually, you started uh, a little bit before yeah, that. Yeah, a little okay. bit before that. Okay. So uh, I will. Yeah, uh, I'll give my dad some credit on this. Okay. Uh, really, it was it was an opportunity that came to us right around about 2005, 2006. That okay. this concept was out there that they were putting holes in these slabs, and it was well, how do we fix this? Like, what what can we do? And as an organization, my dad helped lead the charge on it is we, we spent five years developing the first adhesive that could be utilized for this application. Because what we have to explain to people is my job is in, in the tilt-up space is to bond everything together for about two to three months max. But I can't damage that surface afterwards. So when they lift everything up, I can't be worse than the, the nail holes they were putting in. Okay. So people originally, they literally went to the store and bought uh, liquid nails and they would put all the material down and yeah, it glued and it held, <laughs> yeah. it held really well. And yeah. when they lifted everything up, they were pulling up concrete everywhere and actually made a very bad uh, concrete okay. surface. Okay. So, so we, we spent time on that. My dad helped lead the charge, but the, the story that in our family is the one we joke about over Thanksgiving every year is that once we had gone through all the journey, uh, I had a, I was getting my MBA at the time and I actually had a class project where the group of MBA students and myself, we worked on launching this product. And um, my dad and I were sitting at breakfast one day and I presented him our year end project of, hey, here's what, everything I did. Let's take this thing to market, dad. You know, let's oh, do wow. this. I, you know, I want to spearhead this. I think this is going to be a big deal for our organization to growth. And my dad was so focused on manufacturing, he really couldn't. I'm not trying to make it sound bad. It's almost like his vision was so far over here. And then we were trying to go this direction. And maybe the, where he was the stage in his career or, you know, maybe just, hey, I just I don't want to try anything new. Sure. He just didn't want to do it. And the quote he said to me is, Chad, if we do more than $10,000 a year in sales of this product, I would be impressed. <laughs> okay. We're doing a lot more yeah, than $10,000 so. yeah. a okay. year. Yeah. I mean, it's, it has been a total change from that side. Yeah. Okay. So... So that brings up one of the obvious challenges for you know father son or first generation second generation type businesses, right? I mean, it's just there's there's so many opportunities to you know I guess have some conflict, and yet you know your family, right? So so like you said, you're having this conversation. It's like over breakfast, for instance, or whatever it may be. That that seems to me that's where the real challenge is. Where you know usually. You know, we have our business world where we have these conflicts. Then we go home to our family, right? And that's that's not the case when it's a family business. Uh, no, and I don't know how much time you've got on this podcast, <laughs> but I have, I have a lot of uh, things on this. But we're, one thing I do, like when I've, when I've spoken on this or I've been on panel discussions, um, one of the things I like to bring to the forefront early on in that discussion is to sort of take a little bit of a step back in the history of the relationship. Because if we think about, and let, for sake of this conversation, mm -hmm. let's talk about parent-child. Uh, because you can have uncles and grandparents and it gets a little bit more complicated. But you know, let's talk you know, parent-child. Um, if you think about, let's say that you have a parent who is, they're in their early 60s, so the child may be in the range of 25 to 30-ish, something like that. So they're relatively new out of school, maybe had some experience outside of the family business and how is back in the business. And they start working together. And, um, and one of the, the things that starts to percolate is that the child's view of the parent, in, even in the working space, is still as a parent. 
So if you think okay. about, you know, they were so the ones that went to the soccer games. Yeah, I can see what you're saying yeah. because, I, it's, I mean, a lot of times I'll joke that, you know, my kids have no idea what I do when I go to work, right? I mean, why would they? They're very rarely here, right? Yeah. So, so you know, their perception of me has absolutely nothing to do with what I do for a living. Correct. And okay. so how would you like when your kid shows up one day and, you know, you yeah. have him on board. Hey, it's so sun. It's good to have you on board. I'm so excited. And they look at whatever. Pick one thing. The color of your wall, whatever. And they come to you one day and they say, hey, Dad, you know, why did you choose this design? Yeah. It, yeah. It's dumb. That's hurtful. It hurt. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me tell you something, son. <laughs> you know, I've been working in this way for you know thirty years. Sure. You know, my blood, sweat, and tears are in this thing, and now you're going to come in and just basically um, criticize mm -hmm. things. And it may be again the parent-child relationship. We've never had a discussion, and I think this is where that disconnect starts when you have to have multiple when you have multiple generations trying to run a business. Is there's never a discussion about how do we relate. Because we've now shifted from parent-child to coworker, maybe partner. Yeah. And then, like, okay, well, am I allowed to criticize you? Am I allowed to tell you that your decision to do X was a bad idea, or am I truly just an employee that should, you know, keep my you know, nose the ground? Well, I mean, there's no no way not to bring in just basically whatever that relationship was previously to coming into business with each other. I mean, that's, that's what it's going to be. I mean, right? So, so that brings to mind that, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if in the, in the home there were certain, certain rules of behavior and things you can and can't say, for instance, to your parents or whatever it may be, that would translate directly over into the business, right? Unless there's an effort there to, to change that somehow. Yeah, absolutely. And, okay. and, I, and, I, and to me, where I feel like somebody in your position that's working with a, a senior generation, right? right. And okay. they're considering transition. You know, it's on their horizon. Again, they're a little bit late in their career. They're thinking about what's the next step's going to be. And they may talk to you, hey, you know, my son, daughter, nephew is involved. I think that there's an obligation, in my opinion, in somebody in your shoes or the industry to say, well, hey, you know what? If you're thinking about that, you know, you may want to get uh, a consultant or some, somebody outside oh, yeah. where maybe focuses on this because this is going to be more complicated than you think it's going to be. And I'm happy to help you as part of my silo and your journey of getting through it. Right. But there may be some other people we need to add to this if you're truly getting through. Um, because it's sort of like we just expect each other to just naturally make it work and nobody tells each other what to do and 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 what i found when i started to reach out to people about their own experiences people at my age you know 10 years ago going through their own transition is it was almost like a cookie cutter repeatable where my experience was no different to a friend of mine that was buying his parents restaurant no different than a, a friend of mine that was going through a financial, you know, they are, sorry, they owned a financial business. I mean, it was just one after another. Like, well, why are we all facing the same challenge? So what were those patterns that were so similar? Um, I, I think, you know, rightfully so to kind of my point earlier is the, the, the senior generation has built this and it's their baby. Right, they, the blood, sweat, and tears, the missed soccer games, the 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 things, the family vacations that they were working while everybody was out skiing. You know, all those things they went through and they poured themselves, and that be, that business becomes the entity of it's a part of that person. So when you have that next generation coming in, that that conflict of it's mine. This is mine, not yours, mine. And then I know you're my kid, and you're and I've done all these things for you, but this is this is mine and that has been always one of the most difficult things for whenever i talk to people for them to recognize whether you like it or not transition will occur oh 100 percent. yeah one way or the other one way or the other yeah and so you can either be in control of that transition or you can have the heart attack and unfortunately yeah. pass away right and you've got it so you've got to be able to release you know, the, another thing that brings to mind, just thinking of it from the other side, because, you know, I, I built my business absolutely from the scratch. And, you know, we talk about this, you know, that slope from, from nothing to something is, 
is it can be a good long while, and it has, when you were talking about all that, it has all that sacrifice and so forth. And I think sometimes as a first generation, you're like, man, you know, I did all this, and here I am, I'm just like handing it all off, nice, neat, packaged, and, you know, all you have to do, Chad, is just not screw it up, right? <laughs> How hard can it be? How hard can it be? But yeah. in reality, you know, there are still challenges. They're just different challenges. There's a need for, you know, being able to, to make some hard decisions within the business to get, from, get it from that point to the next point because what got you here to, won't get you there, you know, that kind of stuff, right? You know, so I, I can certainly see where I think emotion comes into play here, right? And... More so in a generational transfer than certainly any other kind of transition, right? 100%. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and there's a conflict that happens because not only does there's the emotions of that first generation, but many of that first generation want to see the second be successful, right? I would they, think they, so. Yeah, I would think, right? Yeah. That, you know, most of them are, hey, let's do this, let's get it done. Um, it, but that, that conflict starts to occur and you and I have talked about this before, where it's like, what is actually the end game here? Because you can make the decision as a first generation owner to say, my only goal here is to get to my personal exit. Mm -hmm. and, and that could be an exit to a third party, it could be dissolving, it could be doing a lot of things, or it can be, I want to transition it to my next, my son, my daughter, or niece, nephew, whatever the case may be. But the, the strategy you take with those two different exits can be in conflict with each other. Because if you as a business owner are realizing that my major investment in my life is my business, and that is, my, that is an event for me, a financial event that's gonna be very powerful. I'm gonna sell the business, I'm gonna make $10 million. Mm -hmm. Well, if your advisor is saying, all right, let's take this thing to market, and I want to sell this thing for $10 million, they're gonna to try to drive that price up, right? You wanna maximize that liquidity event. But if you're going and having that exact same conversation with the next generation, driving up the price doesn't help that next generation be successful. No. So, so yeah, so you have, a, you have dual goals in a way that now it starts getting really complicated. You have advisors, as, as you mentioned, that have conflicts as well because of who their client may be and what they're trying to achieve for their client. Uh, and absolutely, it's going to get complicated in a hurry because, you know, you can't, and we've talked about this before with, with business owners, you know, that, I mean, you can't, generally, in most cases, you can't just give your business to your kids, okay? Because, you know, we Sorry. still need to be able to figure out how to retire, right? You know, so you still have that goal of needing to have have funds, but at the same time, that further reaching goal of trying to make sure that there is uh, a legacy of some type. Usually, that's some that's a very strong desire, you know, for parents. Obviously, in that situation, but then maybe they maybe they don't ever actually perceive what they need to be doing to make that happen. Yeah, there was an article I read years ago, and I'm going to butcher this quote, um, but it was reading about family business and transition, and uh, you know, the writer said something along the lines of, uh, a senior generation will give over management significantly faster and earlier in the transition process than they will give over leadership. Okay. And, and so for, for what that sort of looks like in day-to-day is um, let's imagine that uh, you're a senior, um, you know, you're the, the, the first generation, you've been grinding out for all these years, and you've got your son or daughter, they've been working for you for a couple of years now, they're starting to really spread their wings, and you realize, I got this troubled employee that, man, I just don't want to deal with. You know, this is a great opportunity <laughs> for them yeah. to learn how to okay. deal with this troubled employee. Okay, hey Johnny, here's what I need you to do. Uh, we need you to work with this person and get them on a, a plan or figure out what we're going to do as a next step. And so you give it over to them and management, they're now taking that management responsibility. And, and so the son, daughter is going, this is great. I'm getting this opportunity to talk to somebody to expand my own personal experience in the business, exert some authority. This is an awesome experience for me. And for that senior generation, they're like, Whoo! 
Man, I'm glad I didn't have to deal with that issue. Well, and not only that, but you know, maybe you're also trying to you know just kind of wind down a little bit and not be as involved in the day to day. That seems like a good thing to me. No, I, I yeah. have yeah, and so and, and I think for in at the start for both parties, it ends up being fantastic. Yeah, it's good because yeah. you know it's just kind of so now I'm getting used to. Well, maybe I don't go into the office today, and I know I know Junior's got it handled, right? You know that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And I have a fantastic story related to this. <laughs> okay. So you're right. You know, the, the junior gets more and more you know, opportunities dropped on them. Mm-hmm. And, and then what happens is you're, they go out, you know, uh, mom, dad decide they're going to take a vacation or maybe they're going to hit the golf course, whatever. They start living the dream that they've had their whole lives. Oh, I want to yeah. run this business until this I don't great. have to run this I business. Don't, I don't even have to sell this business. You know, Chad's just going to run it for me. It's perfect. <laughs> okay. I'm, I, I, I'm okay. making money. I'm doing all this stuff. Everything's great. Okay. And for that junior person, it's also, we're, we're in parallel. We're great. They're getting experience. They're getting, you know, they're starting. Maybe they've done some hires. Maybe, they, you know, they're building all this experience. But there's no transition happening. No, okay. because one party is super, super happy with life right now, man. It is a 10. <laughs> and this one is, is doing all the stuff, right? Okay. <laughs> They're pushing okay. this ball uphill again. And so you get that seagull management. And so now one day, finally, Junior makes a decision that ruffles the feathers. Uh-huh. It, 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 hey, you weren't here and we had to decide to do X or Y. And I chose to do X. And I know you're upset about that, but you weren't here. So I, the story I love to tell, because this one, especially from a generational standpoint, is just, it is, I, I, it's my favorite thing, my dad and I's relationship to sort of signify where we went through in transition. And that was, this exact scenario was playing out between the two of us. And I'm in the back of our office one day and I see our office manager typing on a typewriter. And granted, this is like 2006 or seven, right? So we probably had computers for a solid decade plus at the office. Couple, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I'm thinking to myself, and I'm just watching her, just typing away at a typewriter. What are you doing? She's like, well, your dad makes me, every new customer we get, he makes me create, type up a Rolodex card. And for the viewers at home that are not old enough to remember a Rolodex. I'll I'll have to explain to Austin what a Rolodex is a little bit later today. Yeah. 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 Um, AKA computer. (laughs) Right. Right. So so I see her doing this and I I just say to her, no, like we're not doing this (laughs) anymore. It's not a thing. This is this is bonkers. Like she and I just hey, well, what are you typing in there? What is it? And I was like, well, everything you're going to do. Let me make sure I understand this correctly. You're now going to go to a computer and you're going to type that exact same information into the computer yeah. into the ERP software, in, in, right? Yeah, right, yeah. right. Yeah, absolutely. It's like, well, who uses the Rolodex here? Your dad? Does anybody else use a Rolodex? No. Okay, we're not doing this anymore. Like this is absolutely bonkers. And you would have thought I started World War III. When my dad came back and he found out that I had stopped the Rolodex program, war. <laughs> I mean, like one of the biggest blowups in our, our history happened. But it goes to this point of where you have a person who has sort of given over leaderships, having a great life, doing everything. And all of a sudden, you start playing in their sandbox, right? Because it probably wasn't about the Rolodex. It was about that I took something away that he had had since day one in the business that had been part of his entire growth all these years, and I now took it away from him without asking. Right. Okay. So, you know, this is why I'm kind of a fan. So tell me what you think about this. Y'all didn't do it this way. Y'all did one big transaction all at once. But um, what do you think about just kind of a gradual sharing of ownership, for instance, to where... You, know, you actually start maybe become start becoming partners slowly over time as you know those responsibilities build for the second generation. Thoughts on that? I as long as everybody understands what the goal is at the end. Um, you know, if you start with the end in mind, then I think that something like that can be very successful. Uh, I think, and you know, 
I'm sure you have a lot of opinion on this, as many business owners, they just want to light switch this, right? Is okay, I'm ready to sell my business in six months. Are we ready yeah, to go? go. Everything's yeah. ready. And I was like, well, no, it takes time. You got to go through this. There's a lot of things we got to do to get to that end point. And, and so I think if somebody wanted the strategy of uh, like a, just a, you know, a, a slow turn that way, yeah. yeah, more power to you. As long as we understand that there is an end at this and that it does, you know, the, it's not, well, hey, I'll get you 10% of the business, but I'm still going to work until I'm 95. That isn't necessarily correct. Productive. Yeah, no, and so and so I'm just thinking out loud. So it doesn't even have to be like an an official ownership share, but there needs to be some type of timeline, you know. And that's that's one of my pet peeves because I hear it all the time. You know, a business owner will say, "Well, I I, I know I'm going to sell in three years," and I talk to him the next year. And it's like, so what, what's the timeline? Well, three years. Talk to him the next year. It's, it's always three years. Always. It's always three years. So what have we done between, you know, a year ago to now to where it actually is three years? Oh, well, so we've done this, the, you know, just getting on to some type of, of plan of action. You know, I, it, it seems to make sense to me. De- definitely. Um, and, you know, I'd love to get your thoughts on why. Because three years, I, I've heard two and three. That's like the most yeah. common yeah. answers. So why do you think that business owners always throw out a two or three year oh, timeline? Well, because three years is, is the first part of kind of long term to where you know that if you don't do anything this year, you, you'll still be fine. I think that's what it is. It's just a, it's a pure procrastination play is what it is. Yeah. I mean, and it, and it works, you know, because you, you can do that for a good long while, right? And nothing happens. Um, I always tell business owners, come up with a year, you know. So, okay, so three years out, you know, so 2025. So you're going to sell the business in 2025. Now let's work backwards, Okay. So if we're going to sell in 2025, what month are we going to sell in 2025? Okay, June. Gotcha. So what do our financials need to look like at the end of 2024? Well, they need to have this, this, and this. Okay, so if that's the case, and just keep backing up to where, okay, so this is what we need to be doing now in order for this to happen in 2025. You know, that's, now you have a plan, right? Absolutely. And, and again, I'm always going to be spot biased from my side of the table, you know, yeah. because I went through it and I'm still younger. Uh, so I, I haven't transitioned my own business yet. Um, but to me, I think that's fantastic. But what I do believe should be happening is a corresponding to that conversation with that next generation that spells out exactly what you just said, but from their perspective. Okay, well, if dad or mom's going to exit in 2025 and they want to get $10 million for this business, mm-hmm. where are you going to come up with $10 million? And oh, what yeah. are the things you're going to have to do to make yourself in a financial position that you can either get it at other investors, uh, you can go to the bank, whatever that other process is. But mom and dad still have to get their money one way or the other. They do. And that, that is one of the real sticking points, both with a generational uh, transition as well as a management buyout is sometimes that second generation just isn't bankable. Uh, you know, and again, that gets back to who has the relationships? Well, you know, mom and dad have the banking relationship. You know, and how do you, how did you do that? So how, how, did, how did you resolve that? Um, well, and before I get, uh, let me cover yeah, that one okay. second. I just want to go back to, and this to me, whenever I talk to somebody that's a second gen, that's going through all this, Number one advice I always give them is you need your own set of advisors today. Not 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 three years down the road, whatever dad's telling you, three years, three years, three years. Mm -hmm. You need them today. You need your own CPA. You need your own financial advisor. You need all of that. And you need to get that team in a room together, not siloing them and saying, hey, what is it going to take for me to get this done? Because I can tell you one of my biggest faults that came through all this was the banking relationship. Because it was I, that 100%. Does not, does not surprise me at all. When I Those went, guys, I, I don't know. I don't want to talk bad about bankers, but it just seems like that becomes a real problem You know, when mom and dad leave the business just about every time. Why is that? The business is the same, right? It's just it's somebody different you know, in the seat. Why, why is that? 
I, if you can figure it out, let me know. I don't because know. if I was an outside third party coming in to buy the business, the banker would probably try treat that third party differently than they treat the next generation. Yeah, maybe so. I, it's just it's it's mind boggling to me because the financials are the same, you know, and and so many times that initial banking relationship is the first thing that gets replaced. Yep, and it has to. There's no choice. It seems like because you, know, you just you can't get done what you need to get done. So, and and in most cases, I've noticed you can go out and you can find a banking relationship that will absolutely do what you need to do. But for whatever reason, whoever was doing it with you know the first generation won't do it with you. Uh, yeah, That's and, so weird. And that, and that happened. I mean, as really? you're discussing, okay. that happened. To you. I, okay. I went to the bank and proposed what the buyout was going to be and what I was looking for, and we were going to do a, a structured mix between owner, you know, um, uh, owner finance, fi- owner finance, banking, a couple other different yeah, things. Yeah. My own money. We were going to have a mix in solving the problem. And I went to the bank and sat down face to face with our uh, you know, banking relationship advisor, whatever the you know is called. Ain't flat told me no. To my face, we're not interested in this. We're not they, doing it. Okay. We're not doing it. They said the only way they would come to the table is if my dad would personally guarantee the note. Okay. And I was like, you want me to have him personally guarantee the note that's due to him? <laughs> I was like, how is that even function? I'm trying to get him out. I'm trying to get him away from having this responsibility. That's why the business exists and all that. And they just basically say, look, well, if that's the way it is, we don't want your business. So they want, yeah, so they want him to subordinate. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So I mean, um, the end of it is we, we worked. We end up working a deal outside of we end up not going through traditional banking to get it done. Um, okay. But yeah. We did. We found a, a, a more creative way to get there. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's good. And you know, let's take it down to some other. Let's take it down to a relationship that's a little bit more near and dear to my heart, and that would be the financial advisor sure. relationship. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't even know if I want to go here uh, because you know we we have. Obviously, I'm in the business market. I'm most, if not most, of my clients are business owners. A lot of them are first and second generation, where I've worked with the first generation, and then I also work with the second generation. And in in a lot of those cases, I, most of them, all of them, if I can think of, have gone pretty well. Um, but it didn't go well in other circumstances. I'm sure, maybe yours. I don't know. What what do I need to be doing? right as a financial advisor to take care of that second gen? Uh, I, you know, I think the good advice, just solid, truly good advice, which is they need their own lawyers, right? Like, so if you were the ones that came to the table and you were sitting down because you have to build trust, right? You're the outsider to that second gen. And maybe they've known you for a long time, but at some point in time, there's going to be a moment that that light switch clicks on for a minute. Rob doesn't have my best interest in mind. He's got dad's best interest in sure. mind. So how do I navigate that? So for you, it could even be just being straight. Hey, look, I want us to have a 30-minute session with you, and I want to give you some advice from how you should be managing the situation. Here's a financial advisor that's maybe one of my competitors, mm-hmm. but I really trust this guy, and they're going to give you great advice on how you should get through this. So here, I'm going to give you this. I'm going to give you these different opportunities. Um, I think also that... Um, you know, when I was going through all this and even afterwards, I'm just searching online, trying to find some sort of playbook for how to go through this transition. Because there's a lot of information on financially getting through that, but the actual meat and potatoes of how it actually transpires, I think if you had a good counterpart, industry partner that you could show at the table and say, hey, if you want to hire him as a coach, great. But if not, here's sort of their you know, top 10 hits of things they would recommend you to do as you go through this process. Things that you're not going to be prepared for today. Your mom and dad are no longer your cheering on the sidelines at your soccer game. They, they're in business and they're trying to be successful in business. And so these are some things, you know, as a potential pitfalls for you. So I think just a way of building trust with that second generation could go a really long ways. Yeah, so you're talking about conflicts of interest, and um, from an attorney standpoint, it's, I mean, it's absolutely required. Like, an attorney will not represent both parties in a transaction like that. It shouldn't. It won't. You know, they're, they're definitely going to represent dad, for instance, and then I would say, you know, 
son or daughter needs to definitely get an attorney to just review the documents. One's going to initiate some documents for sure. It's probably going to be Gen 1. And then Gen 2 needs to have, have their own, certainly their no, own representation for sure. And then I guess from a financial advisor standpoint, there are definitely some conflicts too. Uh, you know, thinking, thinking through them, obviously you want, you've been working with mom and dad for a long time, you know, and you want them to have a really good retirement, right? Sure. Yeah. yeah. But at the same time, you know, mom and dad have also said that, you know, legacy is very important to them. And, you know, what I as a financial advisor should hear from that is that, yes, we need to take care of the kids too, you know, and make sure that our structure is right and that they're going to be okay in their journey as well. Yeah. But there can be conflicts, no question. Yeah. And if in, in, and one of the things I also preach on is if, especially if you're going through an owner financing of that sale, Mm -hmm. that you don't want to make the, um, deal so one-sided that it makes the next generation house poor Um, because that was one of my key takeaways when i started to realize the note that i owed to my dad on a month-to-month basis and looking at the investment in my company it was consuming a lot of the cash and so i no longer had the capital necessary to really make a lot of the adjustments that i was wanting to do to invest more in glue down and to grow as that as our as our new entity mm-hmm. and and so i think from a financial advisor standpoint if i'm sitting on the side of the second gen advising is making sure they're making the right decision that allows them to truly grow that business because yeah most of the the first generations they want to see that next generation successful they want to see their legacy turns out they want to see them get to heights that they never achieved but if we cash strap them at the very jump i mean you're basically putting the brakes throwing out the anchors day one and, and that's any transaction but this one's weird because it's not necessarily arm's length and i've seen it go both ways Okay, I've seen where Generation One sold the business for way, way, way too less. And granted, in that Generation One's fine and all that, but then they look and they're like, "Man, I, you know," then that's just because it's not an arm's length trans- transaction. I think because you didn't go to market and you didn't sell it for really what it was worth. In in most cases, I think you know, a, a business transition is going to be at a lower than market rate. There's no question. And that helps. But then you're right. The structure needs to be do something that makes sense. I would also say that, so, so yeah, it's good old fashioned financial planning, you know, yeah. and I know a guy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, getting in there with, you know, the second generation and going, okay, let's map this out, you know, you know, income expenses, and then what are you wanting to do with this thing? And are you, are you going to have the power to make it happen? Yeah. And not to get on a soapbox right now, uh, my wife and I talked about this a lot. And you think about our educational system and the way we grew up. And, you know, we're, we're taught a lot early on, English, spelling, math, all these things. Where's the financial planning class that we all take? That they, they really goes into the meat and potatoes of how do you run your life. We graduate from high school, we go to college, and maybe you get a business degree, but not everybody does. But it, where's this training? And if you're going to take somebody who's fresh out of college and present to them this opportunity to take this business on, someone needs to mold this. You know, it is, it is like, yeah. a, it is like a piece of Play-Doh that's just been thrown down the table, and we're hoping that they figure it out. Somebody's got to say, okay, well, let's... Let's look at this person as an opportunity. They don't have all these life experiences. They don't haven't had good advisors all these years, and and you know start molding them to something that they can be potentially down the road that's going to help them grow. Well, and, and sure, and you know um, you're right. That doesn't exist. Uh, I wrote a book, by the way, that does that. Just in you case people don't know that, yeah. but you know it's called. Would you like to pitch right now? Yeah, I'm going to pitch it right now. Absolutely. <laughs> Please do. Yeah. You know, Thoughts on Things Financial is a book that I wrote that doesn't have a lot to do with you know, our business owner market. It's almost was like a book that I did write because I felt like that at this, I just remember being that age, you know, and working through all this stuff. I was like, man, it would have been really nice to have known that, you know, you know, that, that it's that kind of book, you know, it just kind of goes A to Z. And I, I rec- I give it to all my, all my uh, clients, kids. You know, adult kids. I'm like, you, you need to, you need to read this book, yeah. um, and I think it helps. 
But the other thing is, is I think, you know, as, as a parent, we do a poor job of that. School does a poor job, okay? But as parents, we do a poor job too. Uh, and we don't want to talk about money as much as we should. And it becomes this big giant black box. And in a, in a business that you're trying to transition, that becomes even a more major issue, doesn't it? You know, that we haven't talked about money. We haven't talked about, you know, what it is maybe you should be doing on your personal financial side to make sure that you're going to be a good business owner, for instance, right? Well, yeah. Well, and if you think about it, I, I can appreciate the, the first generation's uh, response, is, especially if you've had a very profitable and successful business. You could have concerns that your son and daughter is going to come in and just totally mess this thing up. And they come in, they go, well, look, you know, I'm making more money than I've ever made in my life. And, you know, all this is going on. And they just start burning cash left, right, and center because they they don't have any good, you know, personal practices of oh. handle all this stuff. So I get it. I've seen it. Yeah. Okay. It happens. And when it does, it's, I think it's because there wasn't, there wasn't proper process and training, you know, and, and I think that's part of why maybe like a business owner transition to a child probably should take a little bit longer, don't you think, than, than a normal transaction? Well, I don't, to me, I don't, I don't think length necessarily is the measuring stick. I, I think commitment to the transition process is a lot more important because my, da my dad and I's transition took 10 years, but oh, we really God. only worked on it for two Okay. And, and so, because there was always the three year conversation. Yeah. Right. right, and, right and, we, yeah. and we would come up with some little small milestone of like, we're going to go find a lawyer or whatever, right? And yeah. we'd check that box and a year would go by. So I think if, if you say, yeah, I do think that if you're, if you're truthful to each other and we can all agree at the beginning that the goal is X. And as long as we get that goal, and then you already said, I mean, you laid out a perfect plan. Take from that and just move backwards. Yeah. And, and, then, and then if you actually go through it, a lot of these challenges will take care of themselves. But if you wait until the last minute and try to move it on, then that's it. And then we're not even dealing with it. I mean, I know we don't have time enough today to talk about this. Like just all, again, the, what I would call the meat and potatoes, the just how do you handle the management? Who's in charge? Who's the decision maker? Am I in charge of this? Or are you in charge of this? You know, we ran into our company was uh, legacy employees that would always go to my dad, whether or not they now reported to me, uh, they would yeah. always go to them. Uh, if I hired a new employee, they would maybe report to my dad, but come to me. And so there's conflict because it's not clearly communicated within the organization sometimes who's really in control. And then when you get that seagull management comes in and just blows something up, then it creates all that. And so, um, you know, and I appreciate what you do and the fact that you it is part of your business practice to recognize the challenges associated with transition. And you're really focusing and bringing attention to that this isn't a light switch moment for this business owner. But it's not just financial. There's all these other pieces that go with it. Well, you just and mentioned it. Just the cultural issues uh, is, is one. That that's what you ran into with the employees. It was just, it was a, it was a culture deal, yeah. you know? And you change the culture. There's no way you can't change the culture because you're just a different person, right? Uh, yeah, you know, you have different priorities. I mean, I'm sure that if we talked to Austin and he thought about yeah. your business, he would probably, from a, just a generational standpoint, say, hey, yeah. we should be having you know, parties on Fridays, you know, doing whatever. I mean, we already, we already do that. <laughs> okay, well, I don't, I don't know what he's into. So. He's, he's suggested it. We just, we just do all that. Oh, yeah, yeah. fair, yeah. I'm just yeah. messing, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It, yeah, and, I, and you know, to me, I, I know this is, this is like, I, I could summarize this entire situation in one word, and that is communication. I was going to say it for you. I, was, I almost did it. I almost like cut you off and said communication. It, it, so we are so in alignment on that. Yeah. I can't even, just talk. Yeah, that's it. You know, write, write down some stuff. Like, you know, you're just talking about, well, let's kind of write down, you know, who's, who's in charge of what here. It's communication. Yeah. Know? And reminding, reminding each other that this is not an adver uh, adversarial, it's not a hostile takeover. We're family. We're trying to do this together. We have right. the same vision. And it's always going back to that key sort of that part of our relationship. You're my dad. 
I'm your son, let's love each other, and let's not let this business and the challenges with it ruin that relationship. So let's communicate, let's, let's want to do this together with a common goal in mind. And if people did that, so many challenges would go away in the family business stuff. It would, and then let's just talk about guys, okay? <laughs> Let's just talk about let's, let's talk about the the father son relationship itself, you know, with regard to communication, and just even like outside of a business, how how awful we are at it, you know. And it's like, when was the last time, you know, like he said, like I that I've said to like my son for his, so you know, just how do you feel about this, or that he would say no, no, no but but that is huge, you know, asking. So what concern, what fears do you have? about not coming into work every day you know that is a really good question to ask but yeah you know that's not the kind of thing that dudes necessarily want to talk about no and and again you're you're dealing with family or business owners all the time is that that fear of what is on the other side of this door when i walk out of it and and i put the keys on the counter and i say see you later you know, what's that going to be like? And yeah, as a, as a male, to be totally sexist about this, like, oh, yeah, we no. don't deal with that no, stuff. No, we don't do that. It, or, or from the other side, you know, so, so yeah, you're coming in and you're going to lead this business now. You know, what, you know, do you, what inadequacies do you feel about that? Yeah. You know, what if I fail? Right. You know, what does that say about me and if I ruin yeah. my dad's business? Yeah. So, you know, talking through those kinds of things. And, and that's where I think that's where a, like a, a, a family transition could be so cool because you can talk to that emotional. If you can, if you can get yourself to get to that emotional communicative level. Oh, my gosh. You can help each other out just so well. It's almost like you're on the same team. Right? Almost, almost. It's almost like you have the same goal, which yeah. you do, which you don't have that in any, any other kind of transaction. No. So in this one, you should be in like perfect alignment and communicating and supporting and loving each other and all that kind of stuff. And then, and then we still just go and screw it up. Well, yeah, and, and I'll double down on the, the, the <laughs> sexist side of this. There's natural competitiveness sure. that comes yeah. through, right? The, well, I'm not going to let my son be better than me. There is, yeah, it's, that's a fear. Yeah, it's it's that, like this emotion comes through that is it's so drilled down somewhere in our lizard brain that we have to all of a sudden we're losing our our you know spot at the top and we yep. we have to be defensive and logic just starts getting thrown out the window and a lot of the things that don't make sense just start boiling over because you're reacting at a primal level versus you know intelligence yeah, and. Yeah. You know, and, and I think anybody that's been through it, I mean, there's always that moment that somebody else says to you and you go, that was a really good idea, but I can't tell this person that it was a really good idea. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. So communication. Yeah. You know, I mean, just, just talking through stuff uh, solves these kinds of problems. And who, in a family business, you have the opportunity to do that, you know, yeah. more than you do in any other transaction. Yeah. And, you know, I... You know, you can say that, you know, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, when somebody goes and, like, builds a really, really good business, that is an incredible financial gift from a legacy standpoint for a family, you know. So, try not to screw it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah just, just easy. No, no problems yeah. at all. Yeah. 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 No, yeah, it is. And, and I am very thankful. And I, I was talking today about coming here to the podcast and I made yeah. a comment that, you know, um, cause I'm guilty. I, I did a lot of bad things as part of that transition. Um, in retrospect, I shouldn't have done, but one of the ones that was probably one that, that didn't even occur to me years later is I didn't have enough respect and understanding of what my father went through, my mother, to get that business built to where it was. Yeah. Because I was three years old, you know, I didn't know, I didn't right. see all that stuff. And so when, when we started to have those battles, his perspective was nowhere on my radar. And I think, and this is where that concept, you know, being the horse, dead horse at this point, of having those outside advisors, because just like when you're a kid and your parents come to you and they say, don't hang out with Johnny, he's a bad influence on you. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? You're going to go hang out with Johnny, right? right? right. You know, and so anytime your parents do, you're going to do exactly the opposite. And so even if you're getting solid advice from your parent, the natural response sometimes is just going to be like, yeah, whatever, dad, I'm not going to do it. Yeah, and vice versa, you know, it's, it's definitely... 
it's definitely there. So yeah, yeah having having that team and and I love that 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 what you so communication and what you just described is perspective. Yeah. You know, empathy, trying to understand, you know, your your dad or your son or your daughter or whoever it may be from their perspective. Yeah. And that takes communication. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely. No, no no doubt. Well, man, this has been awesome. Man. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm so, so thankful you had me on and I could talk. Didn't get to talk much about glue down, but uh, that's a okay because you know it's kicking butt and doing what it's doing. But I, it I have such a passion for this, and uh, any day that you start writing your book on family business transition, you know, let me know because yeah, well, uh, I got yeah. some I got some things to say. Well, yeah, we have them recorded here now, and um, yeah, for sure, We're, that that book needs to happen because. Uh, you know, not only it, all, our book will be on all transitions. Um, the one that the one that we're working on. You need to write the book on family transition. That's what needs to happen. You have time for that. Yeah, you? sure, no problem. I, I was sleeping on Tuesdays, but I can give that up. So yeah, yeah okay. absolutely. All right, all right. <laughs> Maybe one day. You know, when when I get somebody else to come in that starts taking over those management job responsibilities, and I can start going out and have fun. That's when I'll write the book. Sounds like you've got some good trips coming up or something, don't you? Uh, you yeah. just got just got recently married. I, right? I did, yeah. Uh, my wife's amazing. Uh, uh, yeah, we got married actually in 2020, but yeah. relatively recent. Yeah, and yeah. We went through all of uh, the joys of getting married in a COVID world, and <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and she works for American Airlines, so a lot of free flights, and we get the opportunities to go kind of wherever. And, uh, and if it was up to her, we'd be gone every weekend. Uh, so yeah, so we, we're always trying to go somewhere. We're trying to hit Germany, Jordan, uh, Egypt. Um, what was the other one that she's wanting to do? Um, and she basically just tells me where to go. That's, okay, that's our so, relationship. Well, that's great because you know, the thing that keeps me from traveling big trips like that is the planning. The planning is a lot of work. So if she'll, if she'll just tell you where to be, that's great. Okay. So I'm going to pitch this now. Okay? okay. So anybody out there, if you're watching or listening, my wife is fantastic. She lives for doing that stuff. Wow. And in a world where you know, like travel advisors and all that, like that's not they really don't like, exist. They don't yeah. even exist. Like, yeah. but, but you do want somebody that's going to plan somebody. And she, like she'll have friends that will reach out to her and say, hey, we're wanting to do blank. And even it's like, hey, we want an easy vacation. We know we want to do Europe. Just tell us what to do. And, and okay, well, how long do you got? And she'll come back with a full travel itinerary of here's where we're going to stay. This is the things you're going to do. This is where you're going to see. Da, 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 da. Wow. Uh, that, she absolutely adores that stuff. Uh, I don't know how you can make money on it nowadays. But <laughs> I, I don't know, but I'm telling you, that's that's fantastic. Yeah. So well, if you want advice, you know, okay. get me up on I, that. Yeah, that, I will. That, that'll be good. Well, yeah. good. Well, again, thanks thanks for being on. Um, if we've got some people out there that are listening, you know, that are going through struggles with, for instance, family transition and stuff like that, um, would you be willing to talk to them if they contacted you? A hundred percent. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so I don't know if they get through you or do you want to... Well, if you, if you just kind of tell everybody, you know, how to get in contact with you, we'll put it in the show notes. Okay, sure. Yeah. So um, you can contact me. My personal email is chadbrucku for the University of Kansas, Rock Chalk Jayhawks, uh, at gmail.com. That's my personal email address. Uh, don't spam me with any, you know, Nigerian <laughs> prince. He's, he's, yeah, he's thinking, wait, what did I just do? Yeah, there? exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, alternatively, uh, my, my cell phone is 214-901-1432. I really do enjoy talking about this. And I love helping people uh, overcome these challenges. And uh, maybe in a second career I could do this. But right now, uh, I just enjoy it for the love of the game. Well, I really appreciate having you on and, and talking. It's so in-depth about this important subject. Uh, everybody, thank you so much. Uh, remember, you can subscribe to this podcast. Uh, somehow you click somewhere and you know, it'll, it'll happen. Um, and, and please do, and, and let us know, you know what you like and, and what you don't like so that we can start you know, bringing you more and more content that, that fits you know, what you're looking for. Uh, really appreciate you listening today. Have a great week. Take care.